In this video, I've gathered questions from people like you who have left them in the comments of all of my videos, and I do my best to answer them. Just remember that my answers to these questions are just my opinion, so don't let it bother you. Before we jump into the first question though, I'd like to show you something I'm really excited about. I'll give you a sneak peek on a video I've been working on for a little while. So without further ado, here's that sneak peek. 50 meters of sun-baked sand. Crossing it seems like an eternity for the single hatchling green turtle. But the mighty Atlantic Ocean calls. And somewhere deep inside this tiny reptile, there's a strong desire to answer. Closer to the water's edge, and another turtle marches full speed towards the frothing waves. Its tiny flippers propel it across the hard-packed sand. It's almost there. The other turtle continues its journey, fully exposed to the elements and hordes of feathery predators. Yeah, I'm really excited about that with the little turtles. It was an amazing experience. Um, one in 1,000 of those little guys makes it to full adulthood. It's pretty amazing. They have a hard, hard life uh, ahead of them. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the questions. All right, our first question comes from Shaquille Ahmed Sarawar. I think he's asked questions before. Hey, I have a question. If I don't have enough budget and have to choose between a good camera body and a good lens for bird photography, which one should I choose? The general rule of thumb with, I think, any photography is always to invest as much money as you can in your glass um, because your, your lenses, because you can always take your lenses to different camera bodies. So I would say that you should put more of your budget into the best lens that you can afford. Um, the lenses really, the, the higher dollar lenses really do uh, get you better results and they're worth every single penny. Question number two. What autofocus settings do you use to get more keepers? I assume it's dynamic area nine point, and this is referring to a Nikon D850. I actually, over the course of time with my D850, grew to use four different autofocus modes. I have a video um, that shows how I set up the D850. Uh, you can find a link to that here. I also have a guide that shows you how I set that up as well, and you can purchase that guide in the description below. Um, it's kind of pretty detailed on how to set that all up. That's why I made those videos. Makes it easier. You can just go watch the video and learn all the information on that camera and how I set up the AFC. Question number two is from Jose Hernandez. I use the Sony 400 28 with the 1.4 about 80% of the time, and I'm wondering about upgrading to the 600 millimeter. What is holding me back is... What am I gaining in image quality by using the 600? Have both the A9 and the R4 whose AF is almost as good as the A9. I use the R4 with the 400 plus 1.4 giving me a 560 F4. And when I use crop, the 1.5 crop in camera gives me 840 millimeters still at F4 delivering very usable 20 megapixel files. Why upgrade to 600? Thanks for a response. That's a really good question. Um, my first experience with some really good Sony Prime was the Sony 400 2.8. I used it for about 20 days in Costa Rica and I absolutely loved it. But almost 90% of the time I used the 1.4 teleconverter just like you're doing, which brought it up to 560 or 540. My math is probably wrong, I can't remember. So when I came home, I knew I wanted to buy a Sony Prime. And because I was shooting it at five uh, the, with the 1.4 extender, um, I figured I should just go ahead and get the 600. So I personally prefer the 600 over the 400. I would rather have more reach than more light. I rarely ever shot the 400 at actually 2.8. And I personally think that the lenses naked without a teleconverter perform a little bit better all the way around. So I would prefer to have the 600 F4 without a teleconverter than the 4028 with the teleconverter. But again, that's just my personal experience. I know this 600 F4 pretty well. I've used it for a while and its rendering ability and resolving detail is absolutely amazing. Without a teleconverter, with the teleconverter on the A9 is still really good, but I do notice a little bit difference um, in the autofocus. So I would rather use it without the teleconverter. So I would prefer the 600 F4 for what I do. It, it gets me a little bit closer. Question number three from Carl Ray. Have you tried the Tamron 150 to 600 G2? Thoughts on it? I did try out the Tamron 150 to 600 Generation 2 
long, long time ago. Um, and it was quite an interesting story. I had the Tamron uh, G1, the 150 to 600, and it was failing me. It would just randomly stop working and it got really frustrating. So I knew it was time to replace it. And I fully intended on getting the generation two Tamron. So I actually went down to a local store that had both the Nikon 200 to 500 and the Tamron 150 to 600 G2 in stock. And I tried them both in the store side by side on my D500. And I just simply took a picture of a black and white like copy machine for sale sign that they had on the wall on the other side. And when I looked at the 200 to 500 and zoomed in on the back of my D500 to 100%, where that black letter met the white of the paper, it was a straight line. And when I used the Tamron, the same image from the same uh, distance and all the same settings, that straight line looked like somebody had poured water on the paper and the black had bled through the paper. It was all hazy and really weird looking and just not anywhere near as crisp or clean as the 200 to 500. So I ended up choosing the 200 to 500. And in my experience since then, I've tried like a lot of Tamron lenses and a lot of Sigma lenses, a lot of third party lenses, and I've never had good results compared to like the Nikon lenses on a Nikon body or the Sony lenses on a Sony body. And because of all of that, I've, I, in my own personal opinion, I will only ever buy native glass just because of all the frustrations and problems that I had with all of the third party glass. And the next question is from Calisag911. I love that shirt, Mark. Got a web link where I can buy it. Of course I do. He's talking about the shirt that you see on your uh, screen here, the walk softly and carry a big lens shirt. You can get it as a shirt, a sweatshirt, a hoodie, all that good stuff. And then there's a bunch of other shirts that I have as well that I have created and my daughter has created. So um, you can purchase these. I'll put a link in the description below. You get a cool shirt and you help support me in what I do. Uh, the next question is from Benny. Hi, Mark. I know you own the same Nikon 500 F4 as I do, and that's the 500 F4 GED. I use this lens on my Nikon D850, and I'm blown away by the quality of your Sony gear. Ken always made mad jokes about this brand. He's talking about the angry photographer, Ken Wheeler. But at this moment in time, I regret my choice for Nikon. Do you recognize the difference in quality? Kind regards, Benny. This is a very touchy subject among shooters, especially people that have invested in Nikon. Um, I personally can see a difference in the quality that I get out of the Sony stuff, and that's why I use it more often now. I just like the Sony system better. I think the results are better. Um, I get clearer images, uh, almost like a 98% hit, hit rate, even with the R4. It's just incredible. And then with that Sony 600 F4 that I have, it's just unbelievably good. Now, with all that said, there could be some other things at play here. Um, I'm sure that I've grown as a photographer, so I understand things a lot better. And I've also probably gotten a lot better with post-processing and understanding light um, at the same time. So you gotta factor those into the fact um, that I think I'm getting better results with Sony too, because I've, I've probably grown as a photographer and I understand things a lot better and I'm better at post-processing. So all of that kind of happened at the same time. So it's really hard to tell but I personally feel that I can see a difference in the Sony gear. And this question is from Noel Labet Comis. Thanks so much for the video. He's referring to a Sony A9 setup video um, or an A7R4. The suggestions are very helpful and the organization of the video makes it all very clear and easy to follow. One quick question. I'm in the Northeast shooting lots of warblers amid lots of greenery. The manual focus setup is working great when needed, but zone is too large for these little 10 gram guys. What area would you suggest for them when they're perched? Thanks. Um, the image that you see here was shot on the A9 using flexible spots, small. So it's a tiny little focus area that you can move. You can move it all over the viewfinder. And you know, as soon as you place it on your subject, you don't have to worry about anything in the foreground confusing the autofocus. So I typically have it set up on another button or I can toggle really quick to it um, to activate it. And it's it's very reactive. So you might have to mess around with the AF sensitivity when using it because it seems to be a little bit quicker than zone to move around from one subject to another. So you might need to slow that down a little bit. But I like that flexible spot small. And this question is from P. Kevin Horn. Thank you, Mark. Your videos are always a treat and make me want to go out and shoot some bird in flight. You mentioned waiting for the A7S III, and I'm curious why. I'm guessing for the video, because the A9 and the R4 seem hard to beat for bird in flight. 
Ooh, that's a good one too. I know the A7S III is more of a video-centric camera. It's not really built as a stills camera, although you can take stills with it. So I'm getting it for the video. I've been waiting for a 4K, 120 frames per second video for a camera that does that for quite a while. And because I've invested in some of the Sony glass, when Sony announced that, I instantly bought it because I can now capture a lot of video in 4K at 120 frames per second. Um, every video from this point on where I've done any kind of wildlife, slow motion has always been 1080p, so that's limiting to me. And it's also actually limiting, limiting to all of you um, because you get a lower res uh, production. So by the time I'm done with this, the A7S III will allow me to do quite a few things that I can't do now. One, I can do everything in 4K if I want to, which is just gonna be really incredible, especially with the Sony lenses. Or if I wanted to shoot at a lower res like I have been and, and do 1080p, if I'm shooting 4K, 120 frames per second, I'll be able to crop in a lot and actually get you all a lot closer to the action in slow-mo. Plus, the A7S III does like 240 frames per second at 1080p, which will be incredible slow motion. Like you can just imagine Osprey's coming out of the water at that rate. It's gonna be amazing. And the low light stuff that that camera is capable of, I fully plan on taking that out and capturing some night creatures that I have around here and maybe doing some videos and some night video and photography using that camera. So it's gonna be really uh, useful to me and what I do. And this question is from James Randolph. Uh, Beautiful as always, Mark. You mentioned one Osprey was a female. How do you tell? Thanks, Jim. Um, This image is a good example. The one on the bottom is always gonna be the female. But you'll always notice too that the females have a brown necklace on their chest, as you can see here. Um, And the females are always a little bit larger than the males too. So a larger bird and then the brown necklace on the chest there is always a good indication that you're looking at a female osprey. All right, so someone sent this question in. I can't remember where it came in. I think it came in on my Instagram channel or my Instagram feed, however you say that for Instagram. If you're not following me on Instagram, go ahead. Because I post all kinds of images there in between making the videos here. It can, you can kind of follow me there and keep up with stuff that will be coming out on YouTube soon. So they asked me, how do I keep my lens, the big lenses, from fogging up in hot, humid environments like Florida? So let me show you exactly what this person was talking about. Ah, yeah, here's the perfect example. See all the moisture on the front of this element here? That's because I didn't let the lens acclimate to the outside temperature. So what's happening there is you're bringing your camera or your lens from a nice cool environment like air conditioning to a nice warm humid environment like the Florida sun. And this happens anywhere on the the planet close to the equator where it's hot out. So the easiest way to avoid that from happening and what I do is before you leave, generally I go out shooting in the morning, I take all of my gear, I take it out of the cases. Make sure you take it out of the case because it'll still stay room temperature in the case, take it out of the case and put it outside in a safe place. Of course, if you put your stuff outside where somebody can walk by and take it, it's probably not a good idea. So what I do is I take mine out of the case, I go put it in the back seat of my car and I lock my car and I leave it there before I leave, about a half an hour. So I like to do that about a half an hour before I leave. So if you know what time you're gonna leave, just take your gear and set it outside and let it acclimate to the outside temperature for about a half an hour. And then when you get out, you won't have it fogging up because it would have reached the ambient temperature of the outside world. But again, remember, don't do this if you're in an area where somebody can steal your stuff. Um, I'm pretty confident that nobody's gonna steal it out of my car. I know you're not supposed to leave your stuff in your car, but it's early in the morning and I lock it. Um, Yeah, so just be careful when you're putting it outside so that it can acclimate. All right, we're done. Um, Make sure you share this video if you thought it was helpful. Like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you thought about everything, especially the sneak peek video that I showed. Um, Yeah, I already said subscribe. So um, until next time, I got a lot of really cool stuff I've been working on. It's starting to get really busy um, here in Florida for birds. Plus, I've got a bunch of stuff from Costa Rica I have to get to. I got a lot of content coming. So again, if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do that. And until next time, I'll see you later.